So Andrew Blauvelt, is that the right pronunciation or close? Blauvelt. Ah, Blauvelt. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, is our speaker today from uh, Oregon Medical Research Center, a research dermatologist. Um, actually, a, quite an exciting topic here because I don't think just a few years ago, you, you wouldn't even have this topic. We didn't have JAK inhibitors and we didn't have biologics for atopic dermatitis. We had what now look like antiquated therapies. This is an, an, a new world in how to treat this disease. So thanks for coming and putting up with our technical problems this morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Len. So um, a little bit more about my background. I'm a dermatologist and an immunologist. Um, spent 19 years in academics um, at the NIH and at OHSU in Portland. And then for the last 11 years, I've been running a clinical trial center. And um, it's a dedicated trial center. It's a private center. It's not associated with the university at, at all. So I'm the, the president and owner of that business. It's very large. It's very big. It's one of the biggest dermatology trial centers in the country. Uh, we have 17 employees, um, three dermatologists, seven coordinators, average between 30 and 35 active clinical trials at any one time. So um, we're big, we're uh, bigger than OHSU in terms of clinical trials, uh, more nimble, um, less red tape than OHSU. Um, and I've been involved um, really in an exciting time in dermatology in the last 10 years or so. Um, we've seen this, you know, the, the evolution, which I actually call the revolution of therapies for psoriasis, a moderate to severe psoriasis. And there we just made incredible advances in terms of uh, translating the, the immunology of psoriasis into targeted therapies that give us um, close to 100%, if not 100% clear in the majority of patients without side effects. So that's psoriasis, but you guys are allergists. So um, I give you that preview because we're, we're kind of on the same pathway in a bit for atopic dermatitis. So this started um, later. Um, we, had, we were involved early on with the dupilumab trials and um, it's just continued. And so we're kind of in the middle of it, in the thick of it, I would say. And so I'm gonna give you the state of the art, uh, sort of what is happening right now, what to expect in the near future. Um, and, the, and obviously um, it's the focus of my, um, my clinic and my, my business. And um, maybe for you guys, I'm gonna focus on more severe disease, uh, more moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. So I'll, I'll just have a few comments on some novel topical agents that have been developed as well. So with that, word of the day, purple. Um, I am a promotional speaker for a few companies. I don't do a lot of promotional speaking. Um, I like to give talks like this, my own slides. Uh, because of my position, uh, former academician, and because of the trial work, I do a lot of advising. It's kind of the fun part of my job, I call it. It's, uh, it's helping with trial design, early stage development talking to companies about where their drugs should position. Um, and then after the data comes out, the data analysis and talking about publications. Um, so th that's kind of the fun part. Um, and then obviously clinical study investigator, that's my job. As I mentioned to you, I um, work with a, a number of companies. But they, these slides, all of this, what I'm gonna tell you today, completely my own stuff, my own ideas, um, my distilling of where we're at. So um, first start with topical therapy. So uh, we, we tend to approach patients in two buckets, or at least I do. Um, I do this with psoriasis as well. Um, is this a candidate for topical therapy sitting in front of you? Or is this a candidate for systemic therapy sitting in front of you? So that's, for me, that's the main bifurcation, the main decision point. Um, is it more relatively mild disease? you know, had they had much, not much topical therapy experience, then the patient's going to be um, more of a candidate, if you will, for topical therapy. Um, we've seen um, 
the development, I think, of exciting development of ruxolitinib, which is a topical JAK inhibitor that was FDA approved last year. And then we have two other non-steroid options that are likely to be FDA approved for atopic dermatitis um, in the next year, in 2023. So Pinarof and Reflumalast, um, they are actually on the market, FDA approved for psoriasis, for mild psoriasis. Um, the first drug to Pinarof is the, um, the brand name is Vitama, and Reflumalast topically is Zorave. So I'm not sure if you, um, gotten a chance to play with any of those off-label for your eczema patients, but they, those are on the market now for psoriasis. Uh, mechanism of action, they are, um, so RUX is a, a JAK inhibitor. Topinarov is a completely novel mechanism of action. It inhibits aryl hydrocarbon receptor. I mean, I'm sorry, it's an agonist for aryl hydrocarbon receptor, or AHR. An AHR pathway is a natural inflammatory pathway that we have in our skin. It's uh, evolutionarily conserved. Uh, insects have AHR pathway um, to help them with inflammation. Um, and so this drug activates this natural pathway um, of anti-inflammation. And reflumalast is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, PDE4 inhibitor used topically. Um, there's two other PD4 inhibitors on the market. Um, one is a Premalast uh, or Otesla for psoriasis. That's a pill. And then there's a topical PD4 inhibitor called um, Crisoboral. Um, it's up there, um, also known as Eucrisa. Um, I'm not a big fan of Crisoboral. Um, I think Reflumalast is a, it's actually a much more potent PDE4 inhibitor, and we're seeing much better efficacy with reflumalast compared to crisoboral. Comment on the nomenclature, like how is it that the uh, back inhibitors and all the IDs and so It's just convention. Yeah, convention. They that that's you pointed out. Uh, the the nibs are all are all jack. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there's they're like UMAB and uh, for monoclonal, humanized monoclonal antibody or human antibodies, if it's humanized, it's is UMAB. Um, at some point, somebody developed that. So, so the bottom line here for topical therapy, and this is my last slide for topical therapy, <laughs> um, is that um, there's more and more interest in development now in, in safe and effective non-steroidal options. Um, topical steroids for me are great for a couple weeks use to knock things down. I really don't like them for chronic use. I'm not a big chronic use of topical steroids person. Um, I think um, the last three drugs on this list actually um, will probably, hopefully will get more and more use um, in replacement of topical steroids over time. Obviously we have uh, topical steroids has been around for 50, 60, 70 years, and the pricing is much cheaper for a tub of triamcinolone versus the branded new topical, so price is an issue. But in terms of efficacy and safety, they work terrifically. All right, so again, kind of just um, that bifurcation point, you know, is it a, a candidate for topical therapy? Is it a candidate for top, uh, systemic therapy? Uh, Eric Simpson is a colleague or former colleague of mine at OHSU, um, world expert in eczema down at Portland. Um, he's across town from me now. Um, he, he, he had this paper a few years ago and it still stands pretty, pretty good. So um, failure of topical therapy, right? Failure of topical therapy is a simple way to say, look, we need to, to, to treat you systemically. Um, and there's other things listed there. Um, sometimes cutaneous T-cell lymphoma or mycosis fungoides can be missed. If somebody with widespread quote-unquote eczema, you have to worry about that diagnosis or eczema that's non-responding to typical therapies. Um, and then sometimes contact dermatitis can, can get in the way and, and you, you don't want to miss that either. So you want to ask about contact allergens. 
Okay, so the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus on um, what's going on for treatment of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. There's a lot going on. Uh, if it's in black, it means it's on the market. Um, and if it's in red, it means it's not quite approved yet. Um, similar to what I just showed you, the same convention in the previous slide. So I'm gonna focus on dupilumab. Um, well, I'm gonna compare and contrast dupilumab, tralokinumab with upadacitinib and abrocitinib. So I'm gonna kind of give you an update kind of on those four and then how to maybe have the conversation. Um, obviously one of the biggest differences between those four drugs is the JAKs are pills and that the, uh, the, the biologics are shots. Um, another obvious difference is that JAK inhibitors are more immunomodulatory or more immunosuppressive. And so they're gonna be carrying a longer list of potential safety issues. And I'm gonna do a deep dive on the safety of JAK inhibitors in atopic dermatitis and give you kind of the, really the latest update on, on the safety there. Um, whereas um, in general, dupilumab and tralokinumab are, are generally safe. Um, although I'll talk about a few things that are emerging safety-wise with dupilumab, especially now that it's been on the market for several years. So I, there's, always, there's been a lot of different atopic dermatitis pathogenesis, um, immunology uh, papers. I still like this one. Um, to me, it's, I, I like the, the, the big TH17, TH22, TH2 um, T cells there. Um, there's been a lot of them, there's, uh, but they're all essentially the same. There hasn't been any major changes yet. Um, so we think, of, um, we think of genetic susceptibility as being involved. We think of the barrier being disrupted or the epidermis as being involved in the pathogenesis. Um, we know that those two are often linked as well. So flagrant defects, um, genetically inherited, will lead to impaired barrier or impaired, um, so increased water loss of the skin and more antigens sort of getting through the skin. The immunology portion in general, still dominated by Th2 um, T cells, type two cytokines, IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, IL-31, um, kind of the dominant Th2 cytokines. Um, a, a number of them have been targeted, um, but I, I'd say right now the best thing that we have going are um, IL-13 blockers. So IL-13 seems to be the most important cytokine, at least as, as of yet. And we have two drugs that target IL-13, dupilumab and tralokinumab. Um, another really promising one coming up is called lebrikizumab, and that is also a selective IL-13 blocker. So if you want to know what's more important, IL-4 or IL-13, um, if you talk to the Regeneron Sanofi folks, they're going to say they're both equally as important because their drug blocks signaling of both. If you talk to the Leo folks or the, the Lilly folks, the people developing the selective IL-13 blockers, they're going to say IL-4 does not play much of a role in AD. And I actually kind of think that is more of the case. So all the things that we kind of used to attribute to IL-4 have now been shown to be mostly due to IL-13. Um, they are very similar cytokines. Um, they share a lot of um, uh, functions, but if you look in lesions, you look in blood of atopic dermatitis patients, it's IL-13 and not IL-4 that's dominating in the tissue um, of AD patients. Is that true in asthma? No. So folks say on eczema, but that's, um, I think that's where a lot of the literature came as well from asthma and IL-4. So uh, it was just thought to be. So I kind of just went through this. Um, in the skin, um, IL-4 and IL-13 actually decrease filaggrin expression even more. So if patients have a defect in flagrin and then they have Th2 cytokines in the skin, it's, it's even impairing further the barrier um, because those, that's been shown in vitro. Um, 
They, um, they also have been shown, importantly, recent years to mediate itch. Um, so not only inflammation, but itch is being mediated by IL-4 and IL-13 as well. So um, that's why we tend to see great uh, responses on itch um, when we target those cytokines. All right, so this is a complicated slide. I'm, I don't think you need to know it in detail because um, the bottom line is dupilumab is a receptor inhibitor. So it's binding to cell surfaces and binding the IL-4R alpha, which is shared by IL-4 and IL-13. So dupilumab binding receptor, um, whereas lebrikizumab and trelokinumab are the selective IL-13 blockers. Those are cytokine binders. So they're binding the cytokine IL-13. Um, and some people say they're a little bit different because with Lebri, and it still allows binding um, to the receptor, but it's not active. And, and with, with Trelo, if Trelo binds IL-13, it doesn't allow binding to the receptor. It's really unclear whether that makes any difference at all. Just think of them as two cytokine binders versus the receptor binder. So um, I'm not gonna show dupilumab data. You guys are using dupilumab. Everybody knows that. So I'm going to kind of focus on the newer ones. Um, this is trelokinumab phase three pivotal study. Two trials left and right. Um, I'm on this paper. I think I'm the second author on this paper, third author, something like that. Um, the bottom line here is that the efficacy was relatively, relatively poor compared to dupilumab. So the same measurement here, IgA01, which means clear skin or almost clear skin, the very high bar that the FDA has established, um, it's only 16 to 22%. So 16 to 22% of patients achieving clear or almost clear skin, um, it's, uh, it's in the 35 to 39% range for dupilumab. So almost twice as much um, with dupilumab. What I'm gonna show you though, is this drug looks better when you add topical steroids in, so you get a better response. Of course, your placebo response, which is just placebo plus topical steroids goes up as well. But the key thing for this drug, a trelokinumab, is that it works really, really well over time. I just showed you the week 16 data. The, the patients keep getting better and better and better over time. Um, this is two-year data, and I was the first saw that was just published a couple months ago. <coughs> what we see at the top left is, that the, is actually the percentage improvement in the easy score um, which is the main measurement. And we're in the high 80s. So we're basically seeing patients who are um, 85 to 90% improvement on their score over time um, with continued use of tra trailer. <laughs> so... Um, so any questions about this? So, so this slide has a lot of stuff on it, but I, I really wanted you to concentrate on the upper left because it is the, it's per, it's the average percent improvement in disease. And you see that over time that the average improvement is really high. Um, and then we looked at different measures down below and we looked at different ways of doing the analysis and different statistical ways, and basically it holds up. So this is not a statistical mumbo jumbo, or now that we don't have the placebo arm, you know, oh, they, a lot of times when you look at long-term data, you really have to look at how the statistics are done. Um, this is a real effect. So this drug patient, in the long run, patients do terrific, 
Um, I would say, I'll show it in the next slide, the summary of this drug. So it was approved last December. It's dosed every two weeks, just like dupilumab. Um, it's approved 18 and up, so it doesn't have the children label like dupilumab has the label all the way down to six, year, uh, six months old. But the efficacy is good, especially over time. And I actually think it has less eye issues as well. If you look at the data, um, conjunctivitis as the main side effect of dupilumab, um, we see that less often with trilokinumab. So are you gonna choose this drug over dupilumab? Uh, dupilumab is established, it's in kids, it has long record, insurance companies pay for it. Um, it would be hard to choose this one first, right? But if you had a patient on dupilumab that wasn't doing terrific or had eye issues and um, didn't want to mess with jack safety and didn't want to be have blood test monitoring and so forth, this is going to be an excellent choice. So that's where I think this one fits. Probably second line biologic after dupilumab. Has anybody used this drug yet? Adbri, A-D-B-R-Y, and it's from Leo. This is the Leo drug. Who, who knows? No, it's for, you know, it's all pharmacy benefit manager controlled. Is there a way to compare like two years later? There is, and the Leo folks have done that, and it's comparable. And it's comparable. So um, their long-term data looks, looks right up there with the best of the best drugs. But they have this week 16 primary endpoint pivotal data that is significantly lower than the other three drugs, you know, dupilumab and the two jack inhibitors. So out of the box, not so, not so great. But I think it's probably the safest of the four. So you have the safest drug here. Um, if, you, if you have a patient that just you know, you're not in a rush and you want to just put them on something and, and control them over time. Again, this is kind of where it's positioned right now. It has not gotten much market share in the last year, obviously. Yeah. <coughs> yes, absolutely. So they, um, the question was, can you go straight from dupilumab to trilokinumab without a washout period? And the answer is yes. No issues. Okay. So now we're going to go to um, the latest, greatest new biologic for AD that is not on the market yet, um, but where there's a lot of excitement and it's called lebrikizumab. <coughs> and lebri is... Um, Lebri is made by Eli Lilly, and um, here you see um, short-term results that are comparable to dupilumab, or perhaps a little bit better, depending on the measurement that you use. And we're selectively now blocking IL-13. So no IL-4 blockade with Lebri-Kizumab. So this is the second IL-13 selective blocker now with results in short term that are comparable to dupilumab. Um, this was the initial 16 results um, uh, described in the spring. And then I just presented results literally three weeks ago in Milan at the European Academy of Dermatology meeting for the one year data. And I'm gonna, uh, I think it's kind of cool and that's why I'm showing it to you. Um, because in this, um, in this part of the study, in the green box, we had patients that were being dosed every two weeks for 16 weeks. And I just showed you efficacy that was comparable to dupilumab. But then we took the responders and we, took, and we put, kept the responders either on every two-week dosing or we spread them down to every four-week dosing or we put them on placebo, and then we carried them out for 52 weeks. So this is a maintenance part of the study to look at maintenance of response in the responders. And 
<clears throat> what we're seeing in both studies, this is just two measures, but we have a whole bunch of measures, is that the Q2 week dosing is looking almost the same as the Q4 week dosing for maintenance. That's a bottom line thing to remember, that this new biologic is likely to be having a maintenance dosing of once a month, Q4 weeks, which would put it ahead of dupilumab because dupilumab is every two week dosing continuous. Um, and there's a bunch of measures, like I said, in some of the measures it looks better than dupilumab in terms of efficacy, uh, mono a mono, you look at efficacy numbers, um, I think it's slightly better than dupilumab. The other fascinating thing is the gray lines because these are people that were treated for four months and then put on nothing. And now we're going out to a year and almost half of the patients are being maintained at zero one, which means clear skin or almost clear skin without being treated with anything. So what does that say to you? How long were they treated back? 16 weeks. And then this is all, everything I'm showing you here in the gray line are people that are on placebo shots. So they, they hold, they maintain their responses for a long period of time, at least a, a good chunk of them, half of them. Um, and so we're starting to use the term disease modification um, for this particular data. So we're, we're seeing evidence that we don't need to continuously dose patients like we have been with dupilumab, where patients every two weeks forever, and there's no really good data. Um, for There's some randomized withdrawal data for dupilumab, but it doesn't look anything like this. So there's something about hitting for 16 weeks with selective IL-13 blockade, we're seeing, um, at least in a portion of patients, um, some evidence of disease modification, if you will. Molecule that was in that failed in asthma? It is. And it's repurposed in higher dosing. It was a dermatologist named Gene Bauer who established a company called Dermira, and he did the a phase 2B in atopic dermatitis with higher dosing and show the comparable results are slightly better than dupilumab. And then he sold it to Lilly and took over for the phase three. So Gene Bauer is the answer. I know, I know him well. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's now talk just two slides about side effects and safety of biologics. So, we're seeing, I would say, in general, I'm going to make the statement that in general, trilokinumab and lebrikizumab have comparable safety profiles to dupilumab. And that makes sense, right? It's very similar um, MOA, except for the IL-4 piece. Now, for me, dupilumab, I don't know if for you guys, this is the dominant side effect. This is the one. This is the one thing that I tell patients because it's pretty common. Um, if you, in my experience, it's 10 to 20%. If you look at the literature, most of the time it's in that percentage. Sometimes it's even higher. Some clinics reported in 40% of patients. I don't really believe that, but um, it's pretty significant. Um, it can be very mild to very severe. It can be just a little bit of dry eye, a little bit of eye itching, all the way to full on bright red eyes. You walk in the room and, and their eyes are just bright red staring at you. Um, so it can be not much to a lot. I'd say in my experience, and I've had, I've had a lot of patients treated with Dupaymab, um, probably about 200. Um, it's 10 to 20%. And most of the cases are mild to moderate. And most of the time, patient, patients can continue their drug. I have a go-to ophthalmologist uh, in, in my town. He, we send him every, uh, every conjunctivitis case, and I let him manage it. <laughs> um, I, you, if you don't 
have a, an ophthalmology consult right away, you can just start with saline drops. Um, simple topical steroids in drops can work well as well. Topical cyclosporin can also work well in short-term periods. So you guys know this. Now, you may not know this. You may not know this because there has been a scouring of cases uh, that have been reported post-marketing for dupilumab. And so this is a paper that just came out in one of the best journals in dermatology, the Journal of Investigative Dermatology. And it talks about rare reports um, of side effects from dupilumab from the, like the market database. So these are post-marketing reports. And what pattern we're seeing is what the authors call TH17 driven diseases, things like uveitis, seronegative arthritis, psoriasis, um, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, anthesopathy. So psoriasis-like inflammation in dupilumab treated patients. Now, if you, you guys know from way back, immunology, Th2 balances Th1. Well, Th2 also balances Th17. And so we rarely, in my year, 30 years of dermatology, rarely see a patient with eczema and psoriasis at the same time. One is a Th17 driven disease, one's a Th2 driven disease. And so you're seeing psoriasis like things happening, not just psoriasis, but psoriatic arthritis in people treated with dupilumab. And I've had a few cases. I don't know if anybody else has seen, uh, seen this before, but arthralgias, um, yeah. you know, yeah. and it, yeah. So this is what we're talking about now in the green. So is it a big issue? Do you talk to your dupilumab patients about it? Is it something that, is it emerging now? Is it in the label? Uh, not not quite yet, but it's, it's something to think about. <laughs> and I want you to, it's, it's a really important thing to kind of remember, I think, from today's talk. If you haven't heard about this, yeah, go ahead. You said that uh, <clears throat> separated just for patients, Yeah, yeah, that's a little bit older slide um, from the original days when it was asthma versus AD and they didn't see it much in the asthma patients, but that's a good point. Mechanisms still unknown. For the conjunctivitis? Yeah, the There's some theories, but yeah, it's it's okay. All right. So now we're gonna with that, I'm gonna have just one slide. Um, because I'm not a huge fan, but uh Nemolizumab uh, is a new biologic. It's also likely to be FDA approved next year. And the mechanism here is completely different than what we've discussed so far. It, it, it blocks the IL-31 receptor. IL-31 is put in to the TH2 family of cytokines. And it's um, the board question for fellows, it's the itch cytokine. Um, but it's not the only itch cytokine because IL-4 and IL-13 have been shown to be involved in the itch as well. Um, the problem with NEMO is that all the trials have required topical steroids as adjunct because NEMO alone doesn't do much. So blocking itch alone doesn't lead to much change in the inflammation. So it's, it's a decent, it's a good solid anti-itch biologic and it's likely to get approved for AD but all the studies have had to use topical steroids um, in combination with NEMO. And even then, the results to me are not particularly impressive. So will this find a place? I'm not sure. Um, maybe in a patient that doesn't have much uh, inflammation, but they're itching like crazy. Maybe this would be the drug that you would choose. It's the one that veterinarians have? Yes. Totally great. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No further comment. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So now we're going to spend the rest of the time look, uh, talking about jacks and, and how am I doing on time? What time is it now? I know, but I want to be done by 8.15. So. Okay, good. good. We got to have something to eat or drink.
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. no, we got a good half hour to, um, at least or 20 minutes to talk about Jack. So, um, so I'm going to be kind of, uh, as the title of the talk is kind of comparing, contrasting Jack's with what I just told you. Because you're going, you have these different options now, systemic options for people with widespread disease. And so um, I, uh, there are a group of dermatologists, I'll just say embarrassingly, who have said, well, we're not going to use jacks. They have boxed warnings, not going to go there. I don't want to do drugs with box warnings, which is kind of ridiculous because dermatologists use drugs with box warnings all the time. TNF blockers, Enbrel, Humira, they have boxed warnings and, they, and they're wide, used widely. Uh, Protopic and Elidil have boxed warnings. Uh, they're used widely. So it's, I'm going to tell you the history in the deep dive on the boxed warnings for Jacks because I, this is a crusade of mine for this year because in January we had the approval of two drugs for atopic dermatitis that were JAK inhibitors. And then we've seen all of this reticence in the derm community and it's kind of driving me crazy. So um, I've had four years experience using JAKs um, in a wide variety of diseases, uh, atopic dermatitis, vitiligo, uh, hidradenitis superativa, um, and alopecia areata. We just had a, an approval um, of baricitinib for alopecia areata. So it, it grows hair. So these are terrific drugs in my view and major advances to the field of inflammatory diseases. So, um, so bear with me. I'm gonna try to, I, I'm gonna also want feedback from you guys. Um, you're already being good and questions, but on the safety and on, and on the safety data, because that is the elephant in the room. It's the boxed warnings. It's not about the efficacy because the bottom line is the efficacy is better, and some would say much better than dupilumab, trialokinumab, lebrikizumab. So we have terrifically efficacious drugs. They're pills once a day. Why aren't they being used? Well, because of the boxed warnings. So I don't think I need to tell you this, but... <coughs> These are small molecules absorbed through the stomach and not only absorbed through the stomach, but absorbed through the cell membrane. So the hatch bar here is the cell membrane. So the drugs are actually getting through the cell membrane because jacks sit located on the inside attached to the cytokine receptor on the tail of the cytokine receptor and the inside of cells when cytokines bind to their receptor, it leads to a conformational change in the receptor, which activates the JAK by phosphorylation. The activated JAK then activates STATs by phosphorylation. Phosphorylated STAT then goes and is a transcription factor for inflammatory mediators. So I, my analogy here, it's like a relay race and the one runner is passing the baton to the next runner. And the baton is passed. So biologics are going to act on the first runner. They're going to, most of them, they're going to knock out the first runner. Dupilumab is going to knock out the second runner. It's going to bind the receptor there. And then JAK inhibitors are knocking out the third runner in this race. Now, what's different than a biologic is that you can make a biologic targeting a single cytokine, right? IL-13, let's say. When you block JAK, you block a family of cytokines. Because as shown here, there's a family of TH2 cytokines that all utilize JAK1 in their signaling as their third runner. So when you start blocking JAKs, you're, not, you're, you're away now from single cytokine blockade. And I call it a family of cytokines or a group of cytokines that you're blocking. It's still less immunosuppressive than prednisone and cyclosporin and our old friends, which tend to push the whole immune system down. So here we're blocking a family of inflammatory mediators 
Um, so more immunomodulatory than biologics, less so than widespread immune suppressive drugs. That suggests if we just discovered prednisone now, it would have a black box. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so as promised, here is the phase three upadacitinib efficacy data where I said it's better than dupilumab. So here we have our good old friend again, IgA01. And to remind you again, it's clear skin or almost clear skin. And with the higher dose, um, we have the two doses here in, in blue and pink, in study one and study two. And with the higher dose, you see 52 to 62% of patients with IgA01. It was, it's 37 for dupilumab. I, I, it's actually literally it's 36 to 39 for dupilumab. And here we're 52 to 62% is the efficacy range. And then for the lower dose, we're 39 to 48% at the 15 milligrams a day. So it's, this comes in 15s and in 30s. Um, this is the AbV drug, by the way. So the brand name is, uh, is Rinvoke. Um, it, it's one paper, Lancet, yeah. Um, I'm also in that paper as well. So um, um, really important data, really important efficacy, better than, and I like to say it, this paper, shows the best efficacy we have seen to date for atopic dermatitis. So this, this is the one paper that um, phase three, large study, two studies, um, the best efficacy um, is with this drug. Okay. Now over time, I think this is, no, this is with steroids, I'm sorry. So this is one with steroids. So every trial, every AD drug has a monotherapy studies, and then they have it with topical steroids um, so that the drug companies can say in the label can be used with or without topical steroids. And sometimes you see a boost and sometimes you don't see much of a boost. And it's interesting that with this particular drug, you don't see much of a boost <laughs> when you add topical steroids. I think it's because it's already way up there. Um, so the other drugs that don't work as well when you add TCS, you see them coming up with this one, it's already quite high. And then this is the over time data. And over time, um, not only over time, but it's for the first time I'm showing you high, high levels of clearance. Easy 90 and easy 100 means that the percent of patients who are 90% clear and the percentage of patients who are 100% clear. And look at that lower line. So. Again, the two doses, <clears throat> we're talking about 30 to 35%, a third of your patients with zero eczema, no eczema, out to one year. That's actually, no other drug has that. So that is incredibly impressive. So I may say, well, it's only a third. Well, that's, it's hard. It's hard to get an eczema patient completely clear. We are not curing patients with these drugs. These are treatments. The patients still have the genetics. They still have the flagrant defects. They still are out in their environments. They're, they're in their smoke. They're in the, in the, in the flower, in the garden. They're, they're with their pets. So, so we're not curing asthma because there's, we still have the genetically predisposed person um, in their environments exposed to the allergens and antigens. Um, <clears throat> so what we're doing here is blocking signaling of inflammation. It's not an early, early step, right? So the, the disease is always going to be kind of pedal to the metal is what I say it. So when I see these patients, um, it's remarkable that they have nothing or, or a little bit because I know um, we're not blocking, um, we're not changing their genetics or changing their environment um, when we're using this drug. Okay. And then this one, and I was, I was the first author on this paper. This is also another key paper. 
Um, if you want to get one more paper, get this one, because this is Yupa versus Dupi. This is a head-to-head -head study where everybody took pills every day, one, one pill every day, and everybody took shots every two weeks. And you had, so it was a double dummy. So you had some people on placebo pills and dupilumab, and other people on upadacitinib taking dummy shots. And over a six month period, it was AbV, yeah. And over a six month period, Basically, the bottom line is the UPA curves are all dominating over the DUPI curves. So not only it works better, it works faster. And then for itch, um, is, this is the itch graph here. Look at the drop in itch. Look at this. I mean, this, this drug shuts down itch rapidly. Patients describe after two pills, two days, one pill, one, their itch being significantly improved. So we have two day itch data for upadacitinib. So really pretty incredible drug. And then we have the second one is abrocitinib. It's a selective JAK1 blocker. Um, and by the way, UPA predominantly blocks JAK1. And just for reference, um, our old friend, tofacitinib, Zeljans, is a JAK1-3 blocker. And that's the origin of the box warnings, by the way, is the Zeljans. I'll get into that in a second. But these new JAK inhibitors are more selective than Zeljans. Okay, just that's kind of one of the key take-homes as well. So abrocitinib works well also, um, and it works in the higher dose so again, two, two doses as well, 100 and 200 now. So these two new jacks have two doses, 15 and 30 for UPA, 100 and 200 for ABRO. And you do see a dose response, but the lower doses do really well. They don't work half as well. They actually work uh, pretty well. And then we see over time, the lower doses of jack catch up to the higher doses. So you don't necessarily have to use the higher doses of, of these two jacks. You'll get more bang for your buck from the beginning, but over time, the lower doses work really well. And so the comparison here, 100 of Abro looks similar to Dupi, by the way. And the 200 of Abro looks better than Dupi. Okay, so that's, that's the bottom line for you guys. So both drugs look better than Dupi, especially at the higher doses. This is Pfizer, and it's called Sabinco. Sabinco. C I B I N Q O. So Rinvoq and Sabinco are the brand names. Um, we just know them as Yupa and Abro. Yupa and Abro. I do it. I do it once or something, you know, just this for a hook, so you guys can have a hook or something. Um, there actually was two head-to-heads published now with Abro versus Dupi. So I showed you the Yupa versus Dupi, and it blew it away. The Abro versus Dupi. The first one. There's a story here. New England Journal of Medicine. And it didn't show statistically significant differences. And yet it was published in the New England Journal. This came out, and I was the first author of the Yupa versus Dupi paper, and I sent it to New England Journal of Medicine, and they rejected it. And I said, you just published a negative study. Everybody uses Dupi. And I don't, this is the first study to show a drug is beating Dupi significantly. Oh, no, and they gave me some vague answer, and it, we, and it, and it was in JAM, we, JAMA Dermatology. This paper was submitted to New England Journal. I don't, still not sure why it was rejected because this one was accepted, which is a negative study with Abro versus Dupi. <laughs> anyway, I'm getting a little bit off. <laughs> Sorry about that story. But, um, but then um, Pfizer 
did another head-to-head -head of Abro versus Dupi, a second head-to-head. -head. And now they kind of worked on their endpoints to make it so they would win. And it was published in Lancet this summer, and, and I was on this paper as well. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so um, PPNRS4 is itch. So they pick itch as a primary endpoint, and they they come out of the box faster with itch. And then EZ90 is a is a as I mentioned, it's sort of a really high level of response or ninety percent improvement. So they chose like a you know a high bar of success to separate out from Dupi. Okay, now this is a busy slide, but I'm going to give you the bottom line. This is also I'm I'm, I'm a little biased. I'm sorry, but um, first author on this paper, I love this paper. <laughs> love this paper because in this study, we did similar to what we did in the Lebri study that I showed you a few minutes ago. We treated everybody with high dose abrocitinib for 12 weeks. And then we kept some people on the high dose. We took a third of them and put them to 100 to the half a dose. And we put some on placebo. I just think these are kind of cool studies. So it's like, and also practical for practicing medicine, right? You treat somebody. So one of the things about JAXA is, is different than biologics is we don't stop and start biologics, right? We, we're not like doing biologics PRN. We are keeping people on dupilumab. We're not stopping and starting. Whereas JAX offer the possibility of episodic use as if you might use prednisone or cyclosporin. So this study showed you take the responders, 83.5% <clears throat> of them continue to respond at the high dose, but 60% of them continue to do well at the half dose. And then now 22% of the patients who are taken off Abro and put on placebo um, still are responders. So, Again, high dose better than low dose, um, but you do have people that don't need drug. There are a population of people probably you could treat for three months and then, you know, um, take them off drug. Okay, now to the elephant in the room and it's safety. So I promised to talk about safety. <laughs> Here we go with safety of jack inhibitors. So this is just kind of my drawing to help you um, think about immunomodulation or immunosuppression, if you will. For me, I use the word immune suppression for the top drugs only. I, I really, I don't think the word immunosuppression is great to use for JAK inhibitors or drugs that are sort of more partially um, blocking. I, don't, I just don't put it in the same group as, as the, our, our old friends. And then I do think the targeted biologics, they really are more safe. So here are the box warnings. Do you guys use JAK inhibitors at all? No? So you haven't used them in AD yet? Ah, okay. Well, would you after this maybe? Okay. So here are the box warnings. So there are five of them. Serious infections, mace, death, thrombosis, and malignancy. That's some pretty heavy hitters, right? <laughs> Those are some pretty heavy hitter box warnings when you have death in there, especially, and cancer. Um, so this is the reason why they're not being used by dermatology very, very commonly. Now, where do they come from? They come from long-term data on tofacitinib, and rheumatoid arthritis studies, and especially a study called oral surveillance. And oral surveillance is a study that enrolled rheumatoid arthritis patients that were 50 years old or older. That was the enrollment. They had to have had at least one risk factor for MACE or heart attack or stroke to get in. And 75% of the patients were on concomitant methotrexate and or prednisone. 
That's the population of oral surveillance. Old rheumatoid arthritis patients on immune suppressives who are also at risk for heart disease. And what was the study? It was tofacitinib, Zeljans versus TNF blockers. And they were followed over time. And these things turned out to be more common in the TOFA treated patients versus the TNF blocker treated patients. It's actually not compared to baseline risk or community data. And I always say, well, what if TNF blockers reduce the risk of these things and that the JAK inhibitor data is just baseline risk? But that's not how the FDA looked at it. They see these two groups and there were more cases of these five things in the Zeljans treated patients versus the TNF treated patients over time in this population, high risk, this old population. And so what's happened is they've taken those five boxed warnings and transferred it over to every other JAK inhibitor for every other indication since that time. Now I'm gonna actually show you data on these things. In the atopic dermatitis patients, treated with upadacitinib for three years. And the bottom line, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you and then tell you, <laughs> is that serious infection is the only one playing out in the AD studies. That there's no signal for MACE, there's no death signal, there's no thrombosis signal, and there's no malignancy signal. In the eczema patients treated for three years, we're gonna have three year data now, three years of UPA. So there's only one of the five box warnings is sort of coming out and it's, and it's a low signal. It's not like everybody's getting serious infections. So my ignorance here, but what makes uh, Heart attack and stroke, major adverse cardiovascular events, major adverse cardiovascular events, basically heart attack and stroke. Um, there is recommended blood test monitoring although it tends not to be much of an issue. It's, it's relatively uh, rare to see issues with, with um, blood counts or LFTs or lipids. Um, so here is data now that, that I just said. I, so um, we have on the left is three years of exposure in atopic dermatitis patients in different studies, measure up one, measure up two, and then we have malignancy rates, MACE rates, and venous thrombosis events rates. We have the 15 milligram group, and we have the 30 milligram group. And these are um, rates, so events per 100 patient years. The number of events per 100 patient years. And the key thing for reference is published data in atopic dermatitis patients, the malignancy rate in two papers was estimated be between 0.33 and 0.45 in AD population. And if we go back up at the top, you see the rate is 0 0.4 to 0, 0.1 to 0 0.4. MACE, what is the background rate of MACE in an eczema patient? It's 0.63 published. What's the MACE rate in the AD studies? It's less than 0.1 rare cases. Venous thrombosis in AD patients, the rate is 0 0.31 from the published literature. We go back up here, venous thrombosis rates in the AD patients, less than 0 0.1. This is a take home slide also. Good comment. So these are three of the biggies, right? And, and death is not up here, but death, there's no death signal. So four of the five boxed warnings. So if you're prescribing Rinvoke to your AD patient, say, look, I got to tell you about what's in the label. <laughs> but that where you tell them where it came from for a, a related drug in another disease and that the data look good so far. That's how, that's how I would describe it. That's the truth. So it's a much younger population, right? And it's all monotherapy. No one's on prednisone and methotrexate, right? 
So healthier, younger population. Um, anyway, that's, that's one of the emerging stories here. So it's really only serious infections um, that's coming out at a low level in the AD trials. Um, so here's my, uh, my boxed warning on the JAK inhibitor boxed warnings. The boxed warnings for all JAK inhibitors, including upatacitinib, which is selective JAK1 blocker, abrocitinib JAK1 blocker, and topical ruxolitinib has the same boxed warnings. Are largely derived from long-term data in a tofacitinib JAK1-3 study in RA patients over 50 with at least one cardiac risk factor of whom centralized <laughs> zone and methotrexate. Really, really important. So I'm trying to teach this. I'm trying to teach practicing physicians about the history of this or where it comes from. No. It's, um... So the bottom line, what are the most common side effects? Well, it's nausea, headache, and acne. <laughs> Those are the most common side effects with JAK inhibitors. Um, and they're usually mild, easily manageable, do not lead to drug discontinuation, with the caveat that serious infection may occur at, at, a, at a low low rate. So you do have to kind of keep aware of, you know, fever, that kind of, you know, anything, if your patient's calling you, possibly infected, you have to keep that in the back of your head. So that's, that's an important caveat. All right, so JAK inhibitors exhibit some features of classic immune suppressive drugs, but not like prednisone and cyclosporin. Understand all the possible effects of JAK inhibitors so that you can have an informed discussion with your patients with AD and alopecia areata. Um, there is recommendations for baseline monitoring, CBC, diff, LFTs, lipids, and about every three to six months afterwards. Um, you do have to check for TB. Um, and then there is a note of caution for your older patients, because if you look at the side effect profile in general, you tend to see more stuff in the higher dose versus the lower dose. And you tend to see more stuff in over 60 compared to younger patients, kind of consistent with that oral surveillance data, right? So um, older patients though, get more cancer. They get, more, they get more heart attacks. So a little of this is, it's, if you treat it in an elderly patient, you know, and so one of those things happen, you're gonna have to, you have to think about twice about that is what I'm trying to say. Um, Yupa, this is my essential info. I think I went through this. Uh, one thing I didn't say is that Yupa is approved from age 12 and up. So you can use it in adolescents, and actually adolescents love UPA, one pill once a day. They don't have to do shots. It's terrific for adolescents with AD. Um, and then we got Abro, very similar, 100 versus 200. It's only adults, um, excellent efficacy. There's one more little warning for platelets at the beginning. You can see a drop in platelets more commonly with this drug versus the other one um, in the first three months of use. So the bottom line here is much progress has been made, more is to come, and especially in terms of oral drug options. And then the last slide, mano a mano, kind of putting them side by side. This is my slide. I, I, it's just... These are my terms, it's subjective. This is my subjective view of the world. Uh, I think the efficacy is better with JAK inhibitors. Um, I think the safety is better with biologics. Uh, they're both expensive. <laughs> you have to continuously use biologics, but perhaps you can episodically use JAKs. Um, we have an approval with DUPI and asthma, important for you guys. Um, it's still debated whether JAK inhibitors have an effect on asthma or not. All I can say is anecdotally, in my experience, my patients with concomitant asthma tend to be better on an oral JAK inhibitor for their AD. So, um, but it's 
completely anecdotal. Um, and that's it. So hopefully it gave you some food for thought. And um, that's, that's all you need to know right now. That is the, there's nothing else out there that you need to know. So um, hopefully, uh, and you can have the slides if you want. I saw you taking oh, pictures, yeah. but um, so thanks for your attention. Interesting to me, when we got the IL-5 drugs for asthma, we were left in a quandary because no one did head-to-head -head studies. And I presume, I don't know if you know anything about the politics of how these companies decided to actually do these double-blind, double-dummy studies. It would have been nice to have in the asthma right. field. If you want to comment on that. I think um, drug companies will not do head-to-head -head if they don't think they're going to win. So they won't do it for academic reasons. If they 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 have to think that they're going to win, and that's that's the companies who do that. So that's we uh, IL five blockers don't work very well actually in AD. So they they failed in the AD. It's a little side note, but, but they didn't do them in asthma. So they left us with a quandary of ALA versus right. Uh, right. So it's nice to see. I mean, obviously, this is capitalism. We want to win the study. So this company probably has a good feeling they would be better than you. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Comment? Oh. The topical jack inhibitors, uh, Yeah, it's a good question. So um, the question was about topical jack inhibitor efficacy. So um, the studies were done in a population that had five to 20% body surface area. And in for the all the systemic trials, the entry criteria was 10% body surface area or higher. And so they did have a chunk of patients in the um, topical RUC studies that um, could have qualified for systemic use. So the average body surface area, though, was less than 10. I think it was seven or something like that. So the average body surface area was lower than what you know, as far as entry into the study. Um, but the makers of Topical Rocks, which is a company called Insight, um, and by the way, the, the, the brand name is Absalora. I don't know if you guys have used it yet, but um, it, um, they have done a subset analysis of the patients in their studies that would have qualified by all the criteria for a systemic trial and they show that those patients do really well. <laughs> but it's cherry picking a little bit because um, in the, in the uh, UPA studies, DUPI studies, the average, uh, the average um, body surface area is like 50%. So it's a much, much se severe population in the systemic trials versus the topical trials. So those patients already have more mild disease and, you know, but they're trying to make a claim that uh, maybe the pe people on the border, on the edge, you know, if you're debating whether to use a systemic agent, try our drug first because we have data that says it works really well. The topical, though, has the same black box warning. It does. I don't know. That is like the weirdest decision I think the FDA has made in the last few years. Um, and, you know, some, and I get on the podium and I say, this is a mistake. FDA made a mistake with this because the whole idea of making a topical agent is to avoid the side effects, which they did avoid the side effects. And then other folks are saying, well, um, they saw a drug in the bloodstream. I don't care. I mean, that, those are maximum use studies. So for topicals, there are quote unquote maximum use studies where they bathe people in the drug, like have them use it all over their body. And then they look for a drug in the bloodstream. And yeah, they, you can detect drug in the bloodstream when you're bathing in the cream. Um, but the clinical relevance of that, right, is, is very questionable. So just the fact that they could detect it in the bloodstream led them to put the label on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So the question is about the, uh, some cases. Of, so the, the about serious infection, and I, which I said was a signal. Um, it's the one of the five things that is playing out in the AD population. So first of all, the rate is low. It's it's about two events, two to three events per hundred patient years. So you saw the others are zero point four or or, to, or less, right? 0 0.1 to 0 0.4. So now we're talking two to three. So two to three events per 100 patient years, still low, not super common, but think it, but some of our old uh, opportunistic infections have emerged like TB, um, pneumocystis. Um, now, so, so the, the trend definitely is... Um, is more issues with older older folks compared to younger folks. So the other thing that's happening in some derm practices, there's some people that just don't use it, and there are other der derm practices who are using it, but only in their their uh, people. The, the term that's being used is in their Olympic athletes, <laughs> people who are super healthy. Oops, sorry, super healthy and no no other meds and and like uh, okay, I'm going to give that patient a jack. But the, the bottom, and they said, oh, because that was what was done in the AD trials. And that is not true. The AD, tri the AD trial entry, um, half of the patients had at least one cardiac risk factor. 20% um, of the women were on birth control pills, which is a risk factor for venous thrombosis. So, and, and they didn't have venous thrombosis. Uh, the AD patients on birth control pills taking um, upadacitinib. So um, they, yeah, in general, you know, the clinical trial populations are healthier than real world, but they didn't have a bunch of exclusions of those things to try to get around seeing a signal. So I don't think you just have to, if you're going to use these drugs, I don't think you have to just reserve them to your Olympic athletes. <laughs> um, it's uh, uh, anybody that, so, so what I'm encouraging folks to do is not decide for the patient. Like don't decide, well, I'm not gonna use this whole class of drugs. Just present the pros and cons to the patient. Say, look, we have, we could treat you with, with shots that are they're really safe. They're every two week shots, you gotta kind of stay on them, help your asthma, or you can do a pill once a day. There's a bunch of warnings, but those are look reassuring and and you know and the pills are faster, they're better for itch. Um, the shots kind of catch up, I think, over time when you look at the one year data, the two year data. You know they look really good for Dupi and for Trello. Um, so it's more about it's kind of the first year, or if you have a patient, you want to do it for three months, right, and not forever. And then that's the type of patient as well that you would use this therapy. So there's a number of situations, but I just encourage you to present the options rather than say, oh, here's du here's dupilumab. You know, the, you know, tell them about this. So it means, oh, yeah, I, I hate shots. I don't want to get into that. Like, please, I don't care about this. And, and that's been my experience is people who want jack inhibitors, like, uh, I don't really care about the side effects. I just want to take a pill once a day. You know, the doctors worry more about the side effects than the patients. But it's not, yeah, oh, one more. Yep. Yep. Six months. Yep. And, uh, you know, as allergists, we probably have a pro bias for seeing patients with comorbidities. Yep. And so, as I think, the policy is going to Yes. Um, I think they're going to, so the question is about um, basically pediatric AD and use of JAKs and whether we're going to see um, JAKs move down and also for other atopic conditions. So, um, <clears throat> I think definitely down to age 12. So we got Yupa already down to age 12. 
Um, I don't have insight, but I think that at least AbbVie is interested in going the next step down to H6 for, for uh, Yupa. Um, and um, I, don't, I get vague answers from companies when I ask about asthma and Jax. I, I think it's, I think they haven't seen much, but I, and so they decided not to go there. I, that my feeling is that they're not gonna go there for other atopic things because they have other indications. Didn't mention that, but upadacitinib is approved for five indications. I didn't even say that. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, psoriatic arthritis, uh, ulcerative colitis, ankylosing spondylitis, and atopic dermatitis. So that's the direction AbbVie has gone is more just, you know, not, you know, psoriatic inflammation and uh, atopic inflammation um, and not into the atopic comorbidities. So it's been out and about for a while. Yeah. Urticaria, completely different topic, different types of drugs, but not, not these. Yeah. What a, uh, sort of intuitive, but mention why the JAK inhibitors have a greater risk profile by their mechanism of action. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. I think it's, um, I mean, it's, you're blocking more is the simple answer. And so, um, so I showed you a selection. This is only a selection of the cytokines. So the jack stat signaling pathway is pretty complicated. And they have, <clears throat> there's, four, there's four members of the jack family. <clears throat> jack. <clears throat> Jack one, two, three, <clears throat> and tick two. And they each pair with another form. So they're Jack one, Jack one homodimers. There's Jack one, Jack two heterodimers, Jack one, Jack three heterodimers. So they require a pair. And so you can't get the same kind of selectivity um, when you, you could say, well, we only inhibit one of the four jacks, and they have done that. They can say jack one, but jack one pairs with these other things, and then you have a whole bunch of cytokines more than shown here that potentially. So they're, they're you know, I, I suggest you know if you just look at a review paper for jack signaling, if you really want to get the full um, array of which cytokines you're blocking or which agent, like Zeljans will do this. And then Yupa will do a, a little bit different because it's selective one. So one versus three, you're gonna see inhibition of, but it's more than this. It's, and that's probably that's probably why you see um, an, you know, an impairment in the ability to fight infection because you're, you're blocking a family of cytokines that are involved in inflammation and inflammation is important for clearing infection. Right. It's not T cell inhibition, like you see with cyclosporin prednisone, it actually inhibits T cell function. This is this is the so this these are not inhibiting T cell function, but more of the, the the mediators involved in enhancing control of infection. I've used a lot of cyclosporin for chronic spontaneous bacteria. Careful with it, I've never really found it to be a problem. Uh, here's an old cheap immunosuppressive drug that is used in mice. I think still has a place. I don't know what your comment. I, I mean, I've used cyclosporin as well, like you. I'm, I've been, you know, don't look that young, but I've been a dermatologist for 30 years, so definitely grew up with methotrexate and cyclosporin um, in dermatology as well. Those are go-to drugs for us before the era of biologics. So. Um, for me, um, one year of use, pretty safe. Uh, beyond that, uh, it's, I had a lot of problems with renal function for beyond one year of use, creatinine's creeping up and hypertension sometimes too. All right, thank you.
Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's really a start. 